Hello again. Um, this is a work in progress, so I'm really just going to talk about um, the striking impressions I've had so far from my data collection. Um, I am looking at um, various aspects of the Arab immigrant parent strategy of sending their children back home, because home is a question here, um, for high school. And this is a very common strategy, especially among Palestinians. Um, so I'm interested in this whole, the strategy, why parents do it, how kids respond to it, um, and what this plays in, what role this plays in their socialization um, as Americans, um, because they do come back. This is not a case of returning. Uh, this is not a case of a visit. This is like a circular migration. These kids go to, uh, I've, I've completed my data collection now in Ramallah and Jerusalem. I mean, they go for four years or five years, but they always come back to the United States. Um, so, um, so I'm going to talk about what I, what, what like kind of left striking impressions on me so far because I, I haven't even had all my interviews transcribed yet, so I couldn't really do any kind of an, uh, firm analysis of them. But so far, I've interviewed um, 40 Arab American teenagers attending high school in Ramallah and Jerusalem, and I just came back from Yemen, where um, I only got through 14 and I had to leave the country. But um, th th that's very interesting, and I hope to go back um, to have the comparative aspect. And then I'm going to do, when I leave here, I'll go back to Jordan and do the same thing with uh, kids in Amman. Um, so I don't know yet, I don't have an answer yet to how they manage their identities because I haven't been able to get to that part of the analysis, but I'm not sure that they um, really have it figured out themselves. And in fact, as I said earlier today, I don't think these kids want to be forced to choose because they see themselves in multiple um, ways. So I want to talk first about why I embarked on this um, study. Um, first of all, I was really, you know, somebody who teaches about immigration, I was really fascinated by um, current theories of immigrant integration in the United States um, have an explanation that fits Arab American, uh, the second generation Arab Americans, yet no data, their, their theories are never informed by data about Arab Americans or Muslim Americans or Middle Eastern people. So um, it's interesting that that they have a theoretical framework that actually helps explain some things going out without the input of, of data about this group. And in particular, um, these theories by Portes and Rumbaut talk about the new American second generation, and there's a substantial pattern of downward mobility among uh, the second generation children um, who are racialized, which is a majority of our new second generation, um, that they actually face downward mobility in the United States instead of upward mobility, which is the old pattern. There's another pattern of children of um, upper class immigrants or highly skilled immigrants who um, come with very successful outcomes. And then there's this third pattern um, which they call selective acculturation, which are children of entrepreneurial immigrants um, whose parents do not have high levels, levels of education, do not have exceptionally high incomes, but nonetheless these children are able to resist racialization and resist discrimination and become successful on American standards, which means they get a good education and they make a good income. And Portes and Rumbaut and other theorists of, uh, uh, talk about how the role that this selective acculturation plays is that the parents of these types of kids um, keep really tight control over them and keep them away from Americans as much as possible so they don't adopt American cultural patterns. So they try to protect them from um, American culture. Um, and the, there's a community solidarity that also acts in the same way that keeps these kids from becoming American. And what's kind of startling about this this piece of the theory is that, you know, in the old days with the old immigrants, it used to be thought that um, 
that one was successful, the, the more one culturally integrated and socially integrated with American society, the more likely one was to be successful. And here's a theory, a piece of a theory that says not being American, not becoming American leads to success. So um, this was interesting to me, and it was interesting to me, this pattern of parents taking their kids back home for high school, because it's been, I know it's been going on for decades, at least among Palestinians. Um, and what role that might play in this scenario of selective acculturation. In other words, you can raise your child, your American child, to be, you know, an Arab or a Muslim or a Palestinian, however you want to define it, by, by literally taking them to another country for their adolescent years and then letting them come back um, later. So that was kind of my... Um, <laughs> intellectual curiosity and before I set off for this project um, I spent last summer interviewing Arab American teenagers in Chicago um, talked to them about a number of things but one thing was about their identity and it was very interesting that the overwhelming majority of them said they were not American they did not see themselves as American white people are American you know American identity is reserved for whites that they're questioned all the time about where they're from even though they were born in the United States um, and so on, and so they, oh, I can't believe this, <laughs> sorry. And so they um, prioritized a, a different identity, whether it was Arab or Palestinian or Muslim or, you know, whatever. So that's kind of the base data from which I um, set off. So um, in addition to that theoretical interest um, I had, um, I realized after the Fort Hood murders last year, um, perpetrated by a second generation Arab American um, who I found out went to the friend school. <laughs> Can you imagine? Fits in my study. Um, anyhow, after those shootings, you know, I was repeatedly contacted by the press and do Arab Americans have a, a loyalty problem? Do Muslim Americans have a loyalty problem? Are they loyal to the United States? And, you know, of course, they don't, and you know, I could say that, but I realize we really don't have data on this group of people, so we need to you know, collect more data on these issues. Um, and finally, what propelled me to do this is that um, after two decades of research on Arab Americans, I wanted something less depressing, and so um, I thought working with teenagers would be you know, kind of a nice change, and also leaving the United States would be a great change. So here I am. Um, Okay, so I'm going to talk about really some of the things that um, I have found in the interviews I've done so far. Um, as I said, I also did interviews in Yemen, and I think that it's really, like, to me, it's kind of funny that what, what I would do is I go to these schools. There are all these schools in these countries that are set up just for these kids, right? They're, they're English. They teach, in the, they teach high school in the English language, and they were built for such kids who are making a return mainly from the United States. Um, Ramallah, Ramallah, Jerusalem area has seven of them. In Sana'a I found six, um, and I haven't done Jordan yet. I'm, I know I'm gonna find more there. Um, but what was interesting to me in Yemen is when I would meet with the principals and tell them what I was doing, because I have to get permission, because these kids are under 18, what I was doing. And in Yemen they brought me really Interesting, like one principal interpreted that I wanted kids who had one American parent and one Arab parent, <laughs> which was not what I said. And in another school, they brought me um, a kid that was really a white Anglo Christian American who was born and raised in Yemen. But, I, you know, fascinating to interview this, this kid who actually feels Yemeni. I mean, it's really interesting to kind of look at these from another, you know, from the other side, right? Um, Anyhow, and also in Palestine, I went to a village called Tormos Aya, which is majority Americans and uh, has a pattern of sending their kids back there. And those kids are mainstreamed in the local uh, public schools. So I also interviewed kids there. Okay, so what have I found so far? Again, impressionistically, um, almost every kid I interviewed said they were shocked and angry when their parents told them that they were going back to Palestine for school. Um, and in many cases, their parents had tricked them into this. Um, they didn't inform them ahead of time. They told them, we're going, you know, to wherever, the West Bank usually, for a wedding, or we're going for the summer only. So it was a complete shock to them when they discovered that they were actually going to stay there. Um, so 
They were angered and shocked because they were uprooted from the only life you know, they knew at the age of 10 or 11 or 12 and, and taken to this place that they really didn't know or maybe had visited once. Um, and they didn't speak Arabic. Um, so, and they, they, I asked them what, you know, what did they miss in the United States? Well, they, or not what they missed, but what was the hardest thing about going there? And they said, well, they missed their friends and they missed their family and they missed American food and they missed shopping malls. <laughs> so um, it's kind of interesting because Jordan has all that stuff. So I don't know what those kids will miss. Um, and some of them spoke of athletics and hobbies and, and things like that. Um, so when I asked them what their parents told them about why uh, they were doing this. Um, I really, I wish I had my quotes because they're just so fabulous. I can't believe how articulate these teenagers are. They'd be like, I wish I knew why my parents did this to me. Or, you know, I don't know. They haven't told me. But most of them said their parents wanted them to learn their, their culture and learn their religion and um, learn the Arabic language. That was the main reason the parents gave for doing this. Um, these teens reported substantial um, language problems um, over there. But they didn't speak hardly any Arabic at all, um, especially um, when they first started school. Um, they take, like in these schools, they take every subject in English except the Arabic language, uh, religion, and Quran, which are two separate classes. Um, and it was kind of funny because when I go to school and try to sign up for interviews, everybody wanted to get out of Arabic class. <laughs> because they found it really, really challenging to learn um, Arabic. Any, and most of the kids I interviewed, by the time I interviewed them, they said they were in like third, third grade Arabic or fourth grade Arabic, and they were juniors and seniors in um, high school. So, um, so where and with whom do these kids live? Well, I, there's a, a couple of different patterns going on here. The most common one is the mother stays in Palestine with the kids and the father goes back to the United States to work because somebody has to support these families. And they're not wealthy families. Um, I w I w I'm just pulling out of my head, maybe 85% of the kids I interviewed, their fathers were shop clerks or they owned a grocery store with somebody else. They were not wealthy people by any means. Um, some of them, their fathers had had multiple job changes and had moved to multiple places in the United States. So their mother stays with them, the father goes back to the States to support the family. Uh, again, a small proportion had college educations, most of their parents had a high school education at best. Um, some stayed in their grandparents' house, some stayed in their own home, um, some stayed with relatives, some rented a place, um, anyhow different uh, profiles there. Um, in terms of there, what struck me um, again is that, you know, I think everybody I interviewed so far said they want to go to college and they already had an idea of what they want to be in life. Um, but there are some real problems here because they don't have enough Arabic to go to a Palestinian university. Even at Beers 8, um, the books are in English, but the teaching is in Arabic. So they're unable to go to Palestinian universities, and yet they're not taking the tests and whatever that they need to get into an American university. So in terms of their education, this strategy is a little bit um, problematic. And it's particularly problematic for young women who um, all wanted to go to college, but um, were pretty well aware that they were not going to be allowed to go back to the United States until they were married. So they have the dream and then they have the reality. Um, and they were at this stage where they're kind of like, um, well, you know, they say, I'm going to go to college. I want to get a degree in interior design. And I said, well, do you think you'll be able to do that? Well, you know, I don't know. And my parents want to marry me to this. So whatever. So. Um, somebody needs to open up a, an English-speaking college in the West Bank for these kids because it's really going to hurt, at least the, the girls, it's going to hurt their chances for a college education unless the man they marry agrees to do that. And the girls also were like, well, I hope somebody doesn't marry me just for my passport. So there's all these other, these other kind of issues. Um, really, it's fascinating stuff. I'm telling you, this is just the things that I uh, kind of stuck in my um, mind. Um, and so although most of them said the move to Palestine was a shock, um, they also adapted. 
I mean, after a few years, they did adapt, they did make friends, they did find living there um, okay, um, they were happy to meet their cousins, they were happy to meet the rest of their family. Um, and some of them made friends with kind of locals, and some, most of their friends were like them, Arab Americans. And it's really uh, interesting too because they said that they were um, outsiders there. They're outsiders, I have a great quote, I don't know, something like, we're outsiders in America and we're outsiders here because people saw them as Americans. And you know, there's stories at the friend school of, being, of fights, there's a lot of fights. The boys say that they're picked on because they're American and they have to have these kind of fights with the local boys. Um, when I asked them how they knew they were, how would they know you're American? Um, they said, well, number one, because they speak English or they speak Arabic with an accent, but number two, it's the way they dress. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm just having fun here. Um, so how do they dress? I mean, the girl said to me, well, you know, you see here, there's two ways of dressing, either the hijab and the jilbab, you know, big coat, or the hijab, the skin-tight jeans, and the high heels. So true, I lived right in the Manara in Ramallah, and I thought that was a very accurate <laughs> description of the, but we Americans dress in loose clothing. You know, so if you see somebody, not jilbab, not skin-tight pants, all of them wearing hijab now, um, but in, you know, loose clothing, or gym, you know, gym, whatever you call it, sweatpants, then they know we're American. And the guy said, well, we wear the low-slung pants um, and name brands. Anyhow, so even they have a mode of dress that's uh, different from the local um, population. Um, another thing I asked about was um, how their imagination of Palestine compared to what they found. And I must say, speaking from studying another generation of Palestinians, I thought they were going to say, oh, my parents told me it was this beautiful place with olive tree, you know, this kind of romantic Palestine. Uh, not at all. The overwhelming majority expected to find tanks, guns, violence, and men with beards. And so you realize that their image of their homeland is from the news. It's the same image that everybody else gets, which is really kind of sad when you think about it. Um, American News and Al Jazeera, but the image is that Palestine is this place of massive violence. So when they get there, um, they actually find that it's not as bad as they had expected. Now in the, in the generation prior to them, there were all these kind of community centers that would teach kids about Palestine and give them Palestinian poetry and teach them the Debka, and those centers don't exist now in the United States by and large. And so their only education about Palestine is at an Islamic school. And it's not really about Palestine per se, right? It's about religion. So, um, so this generation, this diasporic generation is kind of growing up with a very different um, set of thinking about Palestine. Um, anyhow, they were surprised by the lack of violence, but they did feel like they lived in a big cage because you can't go anywhere um, in the West Bank. Um, and there's all sorts of document issues. I haven't sorted them out with these kids. Um, you know, some of them don't have residency there. Some of them do. Anyhow, that's a, a story I haven't teased out yet. Um, okay. Um, so, I, you know, I ask them, what is an American? how would they define an American? Because I had asked the kids in Chicago the same question, and they said there's no way to describe an American since it's built on many peoples. And in fact, many of them said they now felt American being in Palestine, you know, which is, which, which is what I, I thought might happen, actually. Um, and they're all planning to come back. I mean, this is a temporary way station in their life. So finally, um, you know, are the parents undertaking this migration of the children to deliberately, selectively acculturate them? Absolutely. The parents are absolutely want them to learn their culture and their way of life and not to be American. Um, it, does it hurt these kids when they come back? I don't think so. I mean, we need to have some follow-up, but if we use data from 
you know, earlier generations, it, it, it actually seems to be quite helpful. And why is it helpful? Well, the word of the day is dignity. Um, because the way that you resist uh, racism and, and being called a terrorist and all these negative things that they learn about who they are in the United States are resisted when they go back home and find that who they are is actually somebody they can be proud of. And so they come back strong and their dignity is high. And if your dignity is high, you can resist the um, negatives that racism causes, which unfortunately other children in this country are not able to resist as well. So, um, yeah, that's it. Thanks. <laughs>